Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you very much for appearing on um, what is starting to become a series of interviews with brilliant cellists who like I admire and as so far I have at least like met or spoken to at least once and um, I was hoping that you'd be able to tell me a little bit um, about your sort of teaching in the next half an hour or so. Absolutely I'd be delighted to and I really enjoyed seeing your interview with Guy as well I think that was your first one wasn't it? That was my first and two days ago I interviewed I interviewed Raphael Wolfish. That's got to go on soon. Fantastic. Well, actually, Raphael was one of my teachers, so that's doubly, doubly nice. I thought Ralph Kirschbaum. He was, but I did have a little bit of time with Raphael in London as well. So, um, yeah, I've been super lucky with my teachers, haven't I? My teacher, Petter, was also taught by him. Yes, that's lovely. Well, that's a nice link for you, isn't it, as well? It is. So, um, Let's get straight to it. So, but firstly, I want to sort of ask a little bit about your education with particular focus on William Pleath. So your education right from the beginning was extremely strong. You said in the interview for Atchison that your mother was an extremely strong bedrock for the beginning of your education. And at the age of eight, you got into the Mandarin school. At the age of nine, you started taking monthly lessons he wasn't your main teacher but you started taking monthly lessons with William Pleath and what I'm especially interested in is how this absolute titan of pedagogy of teaching this man who taught Dupre filtered his genius so a nine-year-old could learn with him I'd love to know how he spoke to you I mean I'd imagine he didn't talk down in the slightest but he didn't overwhelm you either. What was it like? What was he like? I think the first thing I'd really like to say is just to absolutely pay tribute to the other teachers that I had at the same time who mm -hmm. were, um, I think, in a wonderful kind of team relationship with Bill Pleath. So, you know, we were all super lucky at the Menuhin School because he had just decided after years of saying he didn't want to take any children as students, um, he had decided that he would make these monthly visits. And of course, you know, at that age, a lot of discipline is required and a lot of groundwork and building and there's a big responsibility. And I think um, we also had uh, two fantastic teachers that each of us was assigned to one of per week. So I had Jennifer Ward-Clark mm -hmm. um, and uh, then Melissa Phelps was the other week oh, as well. That wasn't um, mentioned on the, that wasn't mentioned on the Atchison interview. Um, no, it might not have been because that was really quite a long um, interview covering many different things. So I think they will have edited a little bit just to <laughs> keep it in, in control. But so that was a, a fabulous, um, a fabulous system for us. And um, you're right. He never. Hello. Compatibilities of him teaching um, in that age group. Uh, at the Menuhin School is that he had such a vivid imagination and imagery and pictorial kind of connection between musical things and the rest of life in the most natural way so it was never contrived you know he didn't mm -hmm. sort of sit and, and think of little phrases about rainbows or something like this this is not what I mean um, but I remember one time just as an example where I think he was trying to help me to have a more more kind of connected and graceful way of using the right hand and the wrist for the bowing and he was just saying you know imagine imagine that it's a fountain pen mm. um, and you know just this whole so many associated concepts were drawn into the one image about if you make a stroke with a fountain pen the different kind of shapes that the ink makes at different points in the trajectory of your movement with the right hand um, and so to I think that was a, a huge gift of his to be able to just pick out something that unlocked so many associated concepts with such a simple and natural direction. And did he talk a lot about interpretation increasingly as you got older I suppose but did you do that when you were I young? Think in a sense there was always talk about interpretation regardless of whether 8 or 18 um, in the sense that he was extremely 
disturbed by slavish um, following of tradition and would always encourage us to think for ourselves based on what was in the school. So, um, you know, questioning was a big part of his teaching and is something which I myself prize very highly, both in my own teaching. I, I feel when you ask questions of somebody, you discover a lot about the thought process that they're experiencing and it helps you if you're a teacher to decide how best you can make your next suggestion. Absolutely, yeah. it's a feedback but process. I, I think it's, uh, for me, it's a very important kind of principle. Um, Absolutely. But, you know, Leith was a supreme chamber musician, as we all know from the legacy that's left with the Schubert Quintet recordings and his duo with his wife, Margaret Good. Um, and so he was constantly drawing attention to the aspects of the music that were chamber music, um, things like articulation, you know, how the string player can try to match more of the positive qualities of the keyboard articulation. Um, but equally, when something wasn't so articulate, you know, how can we best bring the most kind of connected, lush kind of... Sorry, you've broken up just a moment. Places. I see. Sorry, you broke up for just a second. Okay, I, I actually see your internet as a red, uh, you've got a red, um, now it's changed, but I think, yeah, it's a little bit unstable. Never mind, let's... It's okay, my, my video's the one that's recording, and um, yeah, uh, it will turn out right, I think. Sure, if you want me to say anything again, then I'm happy to repeat but, it. I, I, think, I think most of it was captured. Okay. Um, moving on, um, so... Your teaching began quite early, and I know that I'm, the earliest I know of it is that you taught while you were an undergraduate student in the RNCM. What, did you start before that? that? That's not quite true, actually. I was a postgraduate student at the RNCM when I started to do that, but I did teach people who were, you know, some of whom were a little bit younger than me, just by chance. Okay. Happened. Um, so... Yeah. You taught in juniors, didn't you? I did teach in the in the juniors, that's right. So um, I suppose you're right, it could have been that that was during undergraduate time. The courses were a little bit different then than they are now. So initially I was on a course called Professional Performance, which doesn't exist anymore. So I think maybe that's uh -huh. where there's a little confusion. But um, yes, I did teach at the um, junior RNCM prior and to that. And just a few years afterwards, you were asked to fill in for two teachers. Am I right? Moray Welsh and Ulrich Heinen. That's absolutely right. So it just so happened that they both stepped down um, at the same time. So obviously this left a bit of a gap. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the idea initially was just to cover that gap, possibly on a temporary basis. I didn't uh -huh. take all of the students from both. So I think the students were allocated um, to a few different teachers um, but I certainly have a group that had come from those two classes. But it must have... I... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, when I started it, I had a, a combined, you know, cohort of students from those two classes. I see and um, it must have felt like quite a quite a weight i mean i'm not how old were you at that time you I, mean, mean, I would have been 21 20 and you were filling in for um the ex leader of the lso and the cbso and i i don't know if they were still having those roles at the time but incredibly distinguished teachers i'd and i'd imagine as such distinguished teachers that have incredibly personal Styles. I was wondering how you managed to direct this class who had been taught by two teachers who I would imagine had extremely unique ways of teaching. How you managed to unify these people? Well, I mean, it, it certainly was a big responsibility. I think I, I still think almost daily about the leap of faith that I was lucky to have had made in favour of me having that opportunity at the beginning. Um, and I'm also very mindful when I'm making decisions now about these kinds of things, that actually it's not good to be prejudiced about age 
because either way around in terms of elderly or younger um, because really it's the attitude towards being able to absorb and adjust and learn quickly that I think is our biggest um, kind of saviour generally mm -hmm. in life. Um, so I think when I went into this, of course, I felt it was a huge responsibility. I was very aware that there must be many gaps in my knowledge at that stage. But I've also been very fortunate that all of my teachers, without exception, have one characteristic in common. They are all big believers that one size does not fit all in the matters of music and cello playing. And that um, it's so important to examine the individual and their needs and also what stage they're at in their thinking and physically with their playing of the cello and all those things. So I think I went into it once again, going back to what we said before, with more questions necessarily than answers in, in one sense. Mm -hmm. um, of course, yeah, you know, I was very lucky. I did have a big resource because my own teachers have been fantastic teachers. Um, and uh, I, so I went in and just tried to see, you know, assess first of all, what stage people were at with things, what their needs were, um, and then whether there were kind of more needs in terms of structuring things, because I also believe very strongly that you know, study time is time to amass a big tool chest that can serve you well <laughs> right through your, your studies and into your career. So, you know, I was very keen to try and instill some sense of structure into how people could go about also finding answers to problems from the uh, was, was this the point, this sort of leads into my next question, which is, um, it's a good time to go into it. Was this when you really started to crystallise your philosophy of teaching? The one, um, I mean, it might not be so easy to define your own philosophy now, but you must have quite an expansive crystals crystallized idea of what your own style of teaching is now and at some point i imagine you would have began to really refine it to really start understanding what your own style is was this the point where it started happening um well yes i suppose this was the point at which i had the opportunity to work with people at a level where quite a lot of my own experiences of having been taught could be useful um, and I could identify and see some similarities between things which I'd experienced in a positive way when I was being guided by other people and how I might be able to help to guide other people myself. Um, I'm a little bit wary of a sort of um, categorised teaching philosophy. I know what you're, I know what you mean by that qu question. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's more having a set of principles that you really adhere to in terms of what's important that I would prefer to kind of uh, categorize that. I see. Um, the one the, size fits, sorry. sorry. Yeah, go on. The one size fits all approach, that's, I mean, sorry, doing away with that idea is one of your most important principles, isn't it? That every uh, student. I, I think it is, but that's not the same as saying that there aren't some key facts that all of us need to adhere to. I mean, in life generally, it's not productive to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, if we know that, for example, um, if you want to shift well on the instrument, you've got to connect that to a sense of pulse. Let's just use that as one example. Um, that's pretty non-negotiable in my book. So, I, but I don't think that's rigid because that, if you think of the variety that's contained in that principle, if you apply it to repertoire, you know, it's, there's so much variety but you have to have the building blocks you have to have some kind of structure and as we have so many great um bits of material from previous generations you know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel if you need to work on a particular technical technical aspect there is plenty of material that you can choose and then the question is how you use that what it is that you're thinking while you do it how perceptive you are and how adaptable you are so i think you know, what I'm saying is that there are definitely facts of things that are required to do this well. Um, and you could call those methodical pieces of material. Uh, but 
the other side is that there has to be individuality even in those kind of matters and i say that from bitter personal experience because i have really small hands and i'm very jealous of people who've got big hands so you know you have to <laughs> you have to be adaptable um, so, i mean i teach people who are so much taller than me and some even though i'm jealous of that as well so i'm not that tall uh, sometimes they find that there's just too much arm to fit in or you know everything has challenges and needs to be treated with perceptive and adaptable approach and how how did you how did you become aware of um such sort of individual needs for approach was this was this something that was taught to you while you were being taught to teach or something that you noticed over a period of time well i think i'd always noticed you know since uh you know, no, uh, being aware of any kind of playing or music making, the big variety of musicians and their approaches and how wonderful they can be even at completely opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm. Um, so that, um, I mean, take that as an example, Janusz Starker and Jacqueline Dupre. I mean, Janusz Starker was a much stiller kind of player, absolutely brilliant player, brilliant musician. Jacqueline Dupre completely opposite end of the spectrum but yeah, but they're quite they're polar opposites in a way i mean they're both obviously ravishingly uh, musical but, yeah, but they both play superbly well in very very different ways and so i think for me that proves the point it doesn't have to be one way only um, not at all i mean janosch was probably someone who um well dupre would have understood the instrument inside out but i have heard that like everything she did sort of instinctive manner to it and I don't think that can be taught but perhaps Starker's own techniques well I can't really speak for him I never knew the man but I would imagine that his method of playing was almost more regimented well I think that this is where you know going back to, you asked me about my own um, time at menu in school I think this is why it's very important for a student to have enough time to be exposed at the right time in the process to different influences because there's no doubt that having structure and methods is extremely useful a little bit as if we didn't learn the alphabet or numerical foundations it isn't possible for us to have a language and communicate effectively in writing all of that so i think those things are, are very important it's all about what happens at what stage um, and also not making things mutually exclusive. So just because you have method, uh, which is demonstrable and is documented, in other words, exercise books, um, it doesn't mean that you can't apply some of those things into the phrase, incorporating all of the other aspects while you play that particular shift or that particular awkward thing with the bow. Um, so this is, this is something which I find a lot of people um, are maybe not so aware of or find um, difficult to conceive of how those things are combined and I think it's the source of a lot of consternation for students when they feel they've put lots of practice time into something and yet they feel that it crumbles in public or in front of yeah the principle um, must be set in stone it must be something that it must you've got to capture the feeling so that it's not, it doesn't just belong to one particular phrase, it belongs to your very instinct. It becomes yeah. part of your flesh almost. Ultimately, you know, practicing is, is really about um, eradicating any gap between the practice room and the performance that you give. Yeah. And that's a, a set of stages in the process of practice. But if you don't incorporate as many aspects as possible at the right time, then mm -hmm. that gap is still there when you come to perform. And on the subject of stages, I'll carry on with what would be what would have been my last question, but I feel it's highly relevant. Well, I'm somebody, I'm somebody who would love to teach the cello properly soon. And um, I'm aware that the art of passing on the skill of playing is something that needs to be taken incredibly seriously so of course i'd have my reservations about you know my worthiness and you know i imagine that the stage of cellist i would 
be teaching first would be probably an absolute beginner. And in a way, that's almost the most sacred of stages to start a child off. I mean, that your influence on them can make them have a lifelong love for the instrument uh, or to inspire them and then to give them the right start technically. I mean, I would feel more at ease critiquing one of my friends who is level with me than starting off a beginner. So my question to you is, what advice would you give to those such as me who haven't finished their own techniques but would love to start teaching to first timers how would you structure your teaching it you know for a beginner well um, i totally agree with what you've said about that it is the most precious responsibility at that stage and there are many many things that people have to spend years unpicking unfortunately if they aren't guided well at the beginning so i i do very much agree with you i think the most important thing is to really do as much learning about the way that that age group takes in information and experiences and there are so many good um bits of material out there explaining you know very steps a b c d etc on some of the most basic things like the bow hold now the internet is a great resource as well actually seeing how things are taught and how things are done so i would just invest in as much research as possible for all those things talk to people who have done that job with that age age group who are maybe retired from it now or very experienced with it a lot of those people are very passionate about what they do and like to share um, their knowledge and experiences so i think that's that's very very important actually and then the willingness to learn yourself and to consult with other people is very important there aren't that many things that you can't find out if you really want to or if you feel that you're in a, you know into something with a student and you need deeper knowledge you can always go away and and start researching and with other people and finding out so i think it's that kind of proactivity that's, and that's really important have you ever had to rein yourself in from wanting to almost pour all your wisdom onto a child at once have you had to i mean look i i actually haven't taught many children and um oh. i have um yeah, I've, I've felt that very strongly about this question of starting people off being something that you really need to look into very carefully. And so much of my own um, experience was that I remember more vividly was at a later stage when I already had sort of established some of those things. So I, I haven't uh, done that many beginners. And when my students, you know, I've obviously been teaching a while now, so I've, I've interacted with a lot of students and uh, who would like to teach and uh, some of whom who have you know realized that they needed to let's say earn some money during their studies mm -hmm. very reasonably but many of them i've been happy have been you know very responsible about that and thought well i really don't want to do it just for that reason i need to really get some knowledge and um do some research before i do that which i think is very much the right thing Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'd hope that when I start teaching, um, I'd hope that I'd have a fairly consistent sort of model in my head of how the shadow works. The problem is we're always learning and I I would just, the last thing I want to do is confuse a child. No, um, I mean, I would say I've got some colleagues who I think are absolutely brilliant in this area um, and from what I've seen of their work, some of the most brilliant aspects are their ability to transmit that information in a memorable and clear and simple way. So it's not just having the knowledge about you know, what is a good bow hold, but how does a child of six or seven perceive yeah. the mode of delivery of that information? And that's where I think it is really good to talk to people who have a proven track record of success mm. in those things. I imagine even at, even at that age, some kids will 
respond more easily to sort of just quite dry technical information and some kids will be like if you hold it like a banana it, even at that age kids will differ in their mode of learning so that's yes. something you must be aware yeah. yes, of that's uh, you know and this point about things being simple and memorable actually does carry through to the older age group i think in in one sense as well because yeah, you can tell that with the bow hold if you start changing where every single finger goes and the thumb if mm. you know a washington's act situation where <laughs> everything's different and there's no cohesion so you know we all need to be able to get back to one simple principle that's easy to remember at times yes if i can go on to my last question sure. um quite a simple one really what would what rep would you say has proved the most challenging to teach um, for whatever reason? And might that be not the rep that is not really difficult for yourself, but just to teach it? What I might this was a very interesting question when I saw the questions before this. Um, and First of all, I, I know I'm not splitting hairs just about the wording, but I think I'm not so fond of the term uh, teach repertoire in, in a sense. I would say that it's that one is trying to encourage building the right tools to delve into each kind of repertoire Okay. Um, in that sense. So you're not teaching a piece. I mean, I, I won't name names, but I have seen <laughs> A masterclass a few years ago where the teacher literally did try and teach the piece the way they saw it to the student in the masterclass and it was a very uncomfortable experience um, mm -hmm. so I don't think one can do the painting by numbers thing without paying a very high price that personally is my opinion um, what I would say is that there are so many bits of repertoire that are really challenging in different ways and I think Trying to understand the animal that you're dealing with when you're looking at repertoire is very important. So, for example, in Bach, you know, that's in some ways very, very simple, in other ways very, very complex because you've got so many different dimensions to look at. And I would often encourage students to try and look at one life system at a time on music like that, meaning you know, we've got the lungs, we've got the digestion, we've got uh, the heart. Um, and in the Bach, we've got obviously the bass line, We've got the harmonic structure, phrase length, melodic line. The organs. All differences. So um, finding a way to clarify the priorities, the kind of DNA that's driving the music, I think would be very important in something of that nature. Um, if you're looking at Beethoven, for instance, especially late Beethoven, such economy, such brilliance of imagination with such a small amount of material you know, the priorities there would be somewhat different in the way that you look at that and the technical demands that come out of that way of composing for the instrument so um, it would be difficult for me to say that there's one particular work or one particular um, type of music that presented overall the biggest challenge I, I just think they, okay. they all have different challenges I see. Yes, that, that makes that makes a lot of musical sense. Okay, so um, I think that covers all of my questions, and I'd just like to say thank you again for. Great. Thank you. It's been very interesting to talk to you, Joseph, and and very imaginative questions. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment. Um, thank you for your equally imaginative and illuminating answers. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'll see you next year.